Hi, this is a revision video for GCSE English Literature. We're looking at Animal Farm by George Orwell and this video gives an overview of chapter 7. Now this is a slightly longer chapter so this video has a bit more packed into it. By overview I'm referring to a summary of events, a look at key characters and some analysis of important quotations. If you just need an overview of the chapter I do cover that first so let's move over here to give a summary of events. Now we're firmly into the second half of the novel by chapter 7. The bad weather continues and we're told it was a bitter winter. The animals are rebuilding the windmill. This is described as cruel work. Food is in short supply and the animals are hungry. Starvation seemed to stare them in the face. The animals or the pigs trick Whimper so that the outside world is led to believe there is no food shortage. And the hens are told that their eggs will be sold for grain. They rebel by laying their eggs from the rafters and as a result the hen's food supply is stopped and nine die. The pigs continue to scapegoat Snowball and claim that Snowball has sold himself to Frederick of Pinchfield. Boxer continues to defend Snowball and then several animals are executed at what we'll call a show trial. And at the very end of the chapter, Beasts of England is replaced with a new song. This chapter is set in the winter on Animal Farm. You need to be really careful here to avoid inaccurate and clumsy uses of the term pathetic fallacy. Pathetic fallacy is where human reactions are expressed in inanimate objects, especially nature, and is often found in descriptions of the weather. The opening to this chapter is not really pathetic fallacy as such, but we can certainly say that it reflects the mood or sets the mood of the chapter. So we're told that it's a bitter winter and consider the word bitter here. It sounds freezing and uncomfortable. It's hardly a positive start to the chapter. Orwell then describes how the stormy weather was followed by sleet and snow and then by a hard frost which did not break till well into February. All of this reflects life under the tyranny of the pigs. Cold, hard, uncomfortable. You could also consider the idea that Orwell presents the animals as distracted by the weather in this opening. The weather is seen as the enemy rather than the pigs. They carry on with the motivation of envious human beings who would rejoice and triumph if the mill were not finished on time. The reader knows that this is nonsense. We understand that the real enemy is within the farm. Right, now let's move over here to look at the animals who feature early in chapter 7. Now Snowball is mentioned. He's still being scapegoated and as a result the walls of the windmill now need to be three feet fit, thick, which of course means more stone and more gruelling work. We're told it was cruel work and that the animals were always cold and usually hungry as well. Boxer and Clover continue to work hard without complaint. Remember that Boxer re represents the loyal working classes who were eventually betrayed by the Bolsheviks. Orwell mentions that the animals found more inspiration in Boxer than they did in Squealer's speeches. Perhaps another telling remark for what animal would ever survive the pride and hubris of Squealer. Food falls short in this chapter. A key line is starvation seemed to stare them in the face. Again, you may want to look at the irony of this. Of course, it's a metaphor, but look beyond this. The animals are able to recognise the starvation that looms. It's staring them in the face. It's an imminent, real threat. Yet the bigger threat of the pigs, which really is staring them in the face, doesn't seem to have been acknowledged at all yet. Once more, we have a sense of dramatic irony as the reader can recognise something that the animals cannot. Right, if we can just move over here to consider the pig's reaction to the starvation, Orwell writes that it was vitally necessary to conceal this fact from the outside world. There's a huge level of paranoia about what was being reported on neighbouring farms. Once more, it was being put about that all the animals were dying of famine and disease and that they were continually fighting among themselves and had resorted to cannibalism and infanticide. Just put a definition of that here. 
Measures were taken to restrict contact with neighbouring farms and some food bins are filled with sand and then grain placed on top in an attempt to trick Wimper, the visiting solicitor, and their main contact with the outside. As a piece of research, you might want to look up countries who've had a history of media censorship. This means that they limit the information that goes to the rest of the world and also the information that enters the country. This research will make something clear to you that countries who censor the media tend to have repressive governments who often flout human rights. Of course, this is similar to Animal Farm. The pigs censor the information that goes out to the neighbouring farms, as well as the information that comes in, in order to hide the grim reality of the living conditions on the farm from onlookers, and to attempt to convince the animals that they have a good life. Let's now move to a different space here to look at the hens in this chapter. The hens represent the peasant farmers in the Soviet Union. So between 1928 and 1940, Stalin began a process of collectivisation. And this was part of the five-year plans that we covered in the video on Chapter 5. Collectivisation was just as it sounds. It was an attempt to bring together small farms in order to create huge state-controlled ones. Stalin and the Soviet leadership believed that this would increase productivity and food supplies. Now, 91% of farmland became collectivised in the 1930s, but the Soviet Union was not developed enough to cope with such mass production. They didn't have the technology to manage this effectively, and there were several famines in this era, killing between an estimated 7 and 14 million people. And now in the Soviet Union, the peasants protested. They refused to hand over their grain because it was being taken for below its value. But the grain seizures went ahead. Production levels dropped, resulting in further famines. And the peasants, known as kulaks, were punished with confiscation of their land and goods, deportation and even execution. Now we can return to the hens and see the parallels here. When it comes to the decision to make them give up their eggs, Orwell writes that... They had been warned earlier that this sacrifice might be necessary, but had not believed that it would really happen. This really illustrates an interesting point on socialism and, and communism. People often like the sound of it, but when it comes to the reality of having to give up their own possessions to the cause, it becomes less appealing. So they protest, the hens protest, that taking away their eggs is murder, and what follows is the first active rebellion against the pigs. Orwell writes... For the first time since the expulsion of Jones, there was something resembling a rebellion. The hen's method was to fly up to the rafters and there lay their eggs, which smashed to pieces on the floor. That's a quotation. Of course, the hens were punished and we're told that Napoleon acted swiftly and ruthlessly and withdrew all of the hen's rations. That is, he stopped their food. Other animals were punished by death if they were found to be feeding the hens. Orwell's language is sinister when we're told that the dogs carried out these orders, for Orwell writes just that. The dogs saw to it that these orders were carried out. The dogs are executing other animals, but we're given a real sense of the censorship and euphemisms of the regime here. And we're also told that Wimper knew nothing of any of this, which further illustrates how the pigs held everything very tightly with regard to information entering and leaving the farm. The next part of the chapter moves on to more scapego the scapegoating of Snowball, but I'd like you to think about this in slightly looser terms. Really, this section is just about the pigs creating an atmosphere of fear and paranoia so that nobody trusts anybody else. Of course, there are links to Trotsky, but think of it in, in broader terms. The tactic is clear to the reader. We're outsiders who can look on in, in events and see what the animals cannot, so we can see these tactics. And think about why the pigs may do this if nobody trusts anybody else and there's an atmosphere of fear then the animals will never unite to rise up against them and they remain in that ultimate position of power. Squealer also works his rhetoric and convinces the other animals that Snowball was actually in cahoots with Jones and attempted to get the animals defeated at the Battle of the Cowshed. Boxer attempts to speak up, a move which very possibly seals his fate later. Squealer is cunning in his persuasive language here. He employs every trick to convince the animals that they have misremembered Snowball's bravery and that Snowball was actually an enemy. He lies with such confidence and conviction that these simple statements are impossible to argue with. So when they're talking about the Battle of the Cowshed, he says, Snowball was in league with Jones from the very start. And also when Boxer remembers that Snowball was bleeding, Squealer says that was part of the arrangement. Jones's shot only grazed him. And then he goes on to repeatedly ask 
do you not remember, which inevitably makes the animals doubt themselves. Snowball also uses the animal's lack of literacy to his advantage. He says, I could show you if you were able to read it. And eventually the animals accept this new version of history as the truth, partly because the pigs are threatening and they have no choice, and partly because if you're told enough times that you've remembered something incorrectly, then the new version of history becomes your own truth. If everybody around you believes it too, then everybody galvanises everybody else's beliefs. So this next part of chapter 7 moves on to the horrific trials which closely mirror Stalin's show trials. These were trials in which members of the Communist Party, who were accused of being allies of Trotsky or simply enemies of the people, were put on trials. And they're called show trials because the guilt of the accused had already been established and the defendant was immediately executed. It wasn't really a trial, it was just a a show for the public and if a defendant refused to admit their guilt then the trial was not made public but the person was executed regardless. As the trials on the farm begin the four young pigs is the same four young porkers who tried to speak up in chapter five are brought to the forefront and executed. Now you, you really need to reread this yourself because it's such an important part of the novel. Orwell's language becomes more graphic and shocking we're told that hens, sheep, a goose and other unnamed animals were slaughtered and slain until there was a pile of corpses lying before Napoleon's feet. I'll just put that up here. And we're given horrific imagery. The air was heavy with the smell of blood. Now you might want to pause and consider this line because really this image summarises the overarching message of life on Animal Farm. A pile of dead animals at Napoleon's feet. He has ultimate power, corrupted beyond, beyond reason. He does not bloody his own hands or, or trotters, but is such a tyrant over his foot, shots, foot soldiers that they will carry out any order. And as this awful scene ends, the animals are shaken and miserable and they move away and Orwell describes that they crept away in a body. So we're given a clear sense of the, fit, the fear that has united them. And then the language softens and they huddle around Clover, at which point the reader is given some insight into her thoughts. The farm is clearly looking beautiful in the clear spring evening and Clover's eyes fill with tears. She reflects on the original purpose of the revolution and she thinks of how these scenes of terror and slaughter are not what they had looked forward to on the night that night when Old Major first stirred them to rebellion. But finally the reader is told such were her thoughts though she lacked the words to express them. And once more we're shown that those without education or literacy or even just political literacy are open to abuses of power for even if we know something to be wrong we don't always possess the language let, al let alone the courage or the means to express ourselves and bring about change or rebellion and the chapter ends with squealer informing the animals that beasts of england was to be replaced with another song animal farm animal farm never through me shall thou come to harm and what you can understand from this is that the origins of animal farm are now well and truly gone most of the commandments have been eroded, the pigs are living as humans, the animals live in fear and are hungry, and now Old Major's song has been removed from their culture. And on that note, we'll end it here. I'll press on with chapter eight soon. Some of you have exams coming up, very best of luck with them, and do get in touch with any questions. I'm always happy to answer on the comments. Thank you, and thanks for watching. Goodbye.